This is a story about Thomas the Tank Engine. Thomas worked really hard shunting coaches for the big engines, but what he wanted more than anything was his very own branch line. Thomas. Thomas the Tank Engine had six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler and a short stumpy dome. He was a fussy little engine, always pulling coaches about. He pulled them to the station, ready for the big engines to take out on journeys. And when trains came in, he pulled the empty coaches away so that the big engines could have a rest. But what Thomas really wanted was his very own branch line. That way he would be a really useful engine. Thomas was a cheeky little engine. He thought no engine worked as hard as he did, and he liked playing tricks on the others. One day Gordon had just returned from pulling the Big Express. He was very tired and had just gone to sleep when Thomas came up beside him. Wake up lazy bones, whistled Thomas. Oh. Do some hard work for a change. And he ran off, laughing. Gordon got a terrible shock. He decided he had to pay Thomas back. The next morning Thomas wouldn't wake up. His driver and fireman couldn't make him start. It was nearly time for Gordon's express to leave. Gordon was waiting, but Thomas hadn't got his coaches ready. At last Thomas started. Oh dear, oh dear, he yawned. Poop, 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 hurry up you, said Gordon crossly. Peep, 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 hurry up yourself replied Thomas cheekily. Thomas usually pushed behind Gordon's train to help him start, but he was always uncoupled first, so that when the train was running nicely, Thomas could stop and go back. That morning, Gordon saw the perfect chance to pay Thomas back for giving him a fright. He started so quickly that the guards forgot to uncouple Thomas. Gordon moved slowly out of the station pulling the train and Thomas with him. Then he started to go faster and faster, much too fast for Thomas. Peep, peep, stop, stop, whistled Thomas. Hurry, 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 huh, laughed Gordon in front. You can't, you can't get, get away, away. You, can't you can't get, get away. away, giggled the coaches. Poor Thomas was going faster than he had ever gone before. I shall never be the same again, he thought sadly. My wheels will be quite worn out. At last they stopped at a station. Thomas was uncoupled and given a long, long drink. Well, little Thomas, chuckled Gordon. Now you know what hard work means, don't you? Poor Thomas was too breathless to answer. The next day Thomas was working in the yard. On a siding by themselves were some strange looking trucks. That's the breakdown train, said his driver. When there's an accident, the workmen use it to help clear and mend the line. Just then, James came whistling through the yard crying, Help! Help! His brake blocks were on fire and his trucks were pushing him faster and faster. James disappeared into the distance. Soon after, a bell rang in the signal box and a man came running. James is off the line. We need the breakdown train, quickly, he shouted. Thomas was coupled on to the breakdown train and off he went as fast as he could. Bother those trucks in their tricks, he said. I hope James isn't hurt. They found James and the trucks at a bend in the line. James was in a field with a cow staring at him. The brake van and the last few trucks were still on the rails, but the front ones were piled in a heap behind James. James's driver and fireman were checking to see if he was hurt. Don't worry, James, his driver said. It wasn't your fault. It was those troublesome trucks. Thomas pushed the breakdown train alongside James. Then he pulled the trucks that were still on the line out of the way. Oh, oh dear. dear, oh, oh dear. dear, they groaned. Serves you right, serves you right, puffed Thomas crossly. 
As soon as the other trucks were back on the line, Thomas pulled them away too. He was hard at work all afternoon. Using two cranes, the men put James carefully back on the rails. He tried to move, but he couldn't, so Thomas pulled him back to the shed. The fat controller was waiting for them there. Well, Chomash, he said kindly, I've heard all about it and I think you're a really useful engine. I'm sure pleased with you that I'm going to give you your own branch line. Oh, thank you, sir, said Thomas happily. Now Thomas is as content as can be. He has a branch line all to himself, and he puffs proudly backwards and forwards from morning till night with his coaches, Annie and Clarabel. Edward and Henry stop quite often at the junction to talk to him. Gordon is always in a hurry and does not stop, but he never forgets to say, Boop, boop, boop! to Thomas, and Thomas always whistles, peep, 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 in return. This is a story about James the Red Engine. When he first arrived on Shoreshore, he was sure busy thinking about his shiny red paint that he soon got into lots of trouble. I thought I might have to send him away. James. James was a new engine with a shining coat of red paint. He had two small wheels in front and six driving wheels behind. They were smaller than Gordon's, but bigger than Thomas's. You're a special mixed traffic engine, the fat controller told James. That means you can pull either coaches or trucks. James felt very proud. The fat controller told James that today he was to help Edward pull coaches. You need to be careful with coaches, said Edward. They don't like getting bumped. If you bump them, they'll get cross. But James was thinking about his shiny red coat and wasn't really listening. James and Edward took the coaches to the platform. A group of boys came over to admire James. I really am a splendid engine, thought James, and he let out a great whoosh of steam. Everyone jumped, <gasps> and a shower of water fell on the fat controller, soaking his brand new top hat. James thought he had better leave quickly before he got into trouble, so he pulled away from the platform. Slow down, puffed Edward, who didn't like starting quickly. You're going, you're going too fast, you're going, you're going too, fast. too fast, grumbled the coaches. When James reached the next station, he shot past the platform. His driver had to back up so the passengers could get off the train. The fat controller won't be pleased when he hears about this, his driver said. James and Edward set off again and started to climb a hill. It's ever so steep, it's ever so steep, puffed James. At last they got to the top and pulled into the next station. James was panting so much that he got hiccups and frightened an old lady, who dropped all her parcels. Oh dear, the fat controller will be even crosser now, thought James. The next morning, the fat controller spoke to James very sternly. If you don't learn to behave better, I shall take away your red coat and paint you blue, he warned. Now run along and fetch your coaches. James felt cross. A splendid red engine like me shouldn't have to fetch his own cultures, he muttered. I'll show them how to pull cultures, he said to himself as he set off at top speed. The coaches groaned and protested as they bumped along, but James wouldn't slow down. At last the coaches had had enough. We're going to stop! We're going to stop! They cried, and try as he might, James found himself going slower and slower. The driver halted the train and got out. There's a leak in the pipe, he said. You are bumping the coaches hard enough to make a leak in anything. The guard made all the passengers get out of the train. You, sir, please give me your boot lace, he said to one of them. No, I shan't, 
said the passenger. Well then, we shall just have to stop where we are, said the guard. So the man agreed to give his boot laces to the guard. The guard used the lace to tie a pad of newspapers around the hole to stop the leak. Now James was able to pull the train again, but he knew he was going to be in real trouble with the Fat Controller this time. When James got back, the Fat Controller was very angry with him indeed. For the next few days, James was left alone in the shed in disgrace. He wasn't even allowed to push coaches and trucks in the yard. He felt really sad. Then, one morning, the Fat Controller came to see him. I see you are sorry, he said to James, so I'd like you to pull some trucks for me. Thank you, sir, said James, as he puffed happily away. Here are your trucks, James, said a little engine. Have you got some bootlaces ready? And he chuffed off, laughing rudely. Oh, 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 oh said the truck, as James backed down on them. We want a proper engine, not a red monster. James took no notice, but pulled the screeching trucks out of the yard. James started to heave the trucks up the hill, puffing and panting. But halfway up, the last ten trucks broke away and rolled back down again. James's driver shut off steam. We'll have to go back and get them, he said to James. James backed carefully down the hill to collect the trucks. Then, with a peep peep, he was off again. I can do it, I can do it, he puffed. Then, I've done it, I've done it, he panted as he climbed over the top. When James got back to the station, the Fat Controller was very pleased with him. You've made the most troublesome trucks on the line behave, he said. After that, you deserve to keep your red coat. James was really happy. He knew he was going to enjoy working on the Fat Controller's railway. This is a story about the twin Scottish engines, Donald and Douglas. They both came to work at my station, but I only needed one of them. The question was, which one should I keep? Donald and Douglas. The Fat Controller's railway was busier than ever. All the engines had to work very hard indeed. We don't know whether we're coming or going, grumbled Henry. I know you are working hard, said the Fat Controller. Shall I have arranged for a new engine for good work to come from Scotland tomorrow? But the next day the Fat Controller got a surprise. Not one, but two engines arrived from Scotland. They were twins called Donald and Douglas, and they had lost their numbers. No one knew which of them was supposed to stay. One of you will have to go back to Scotland, said the Fat Controller. I will paint numbers on you for now, but I will decide which is the better engine and send the other one home. So the engines were given new numbers, Donald was number 9, and Douglas was number 10. Donald and Douglas felt miserable. Neither of them wanted to stay without the other. We'll just have to be so well behaved that he wants to keep us both, said Douglas. Aye, said Donald. He won't be able to choose between us. The twins enjoyed working on the Fat Controller's railway. They were good at keeping the trucks in order, and they soon made friends with the other engines. Every day, Gordon's express train steamed in with a special coach for passengers travelling on Thomas's branch line. Duck had to remember to shunt the special coach for Thomas to pick up. Douglas said to Duck, Why don't I move the special coach tomorrow? That would be very kind, Douglas, said Duck gratefully. The next day, when Gordon arrived with the special coach, Douglas was busy worrying about being sent back to Scotland. I couldn't abide going back alone, said Douglas to himself. He was so worried that he forgot to take the special coach to Thomas. He pushed it into the siding and went to join Donald. When Thomas came along, he couldn't find his coach. 
A group of angry passengers complained to the Fat Controller. The Fat Controller went to find Douglas. I'm very annoyed, Douglas, he said. It looks as though you may be going back to Scotland. Next day, Douglas was extra careful and he didn't do anything wrong. But Donald was unlucky. He backed into a siding where the rails were slippery. Poor Donald couldn't stop. He crashed through the buffers into a signal box, leaving the signalman sitting on the coal in his tender. You clumsy great engine, cried the signalman. You've jammed my points. The fat controller was very annoyed. I'm disappointed in you, Donald, he said. I was going to send Douglas back and keep you, but now I'm not so sure. Donald felt very sorry. That night snow came to the island and covered all the tracks. Most engines hate snow, but Donald and Douglas loved it. They knew just what to do. They puffed busily backwards and forwards, patrolling the line. They even rescued other engines who got stuck in the snow drifts. All the other engines liked Donald and Douglas. Everyone was sad that one of them was going to be sent away. They were wonderful in the snow, said Henry. What we need is a deputation, said Edward. What is a depot station? asked Henry. A deputation is when engines tell the fat controller that something is wrong and ask him to put it right, replied Edward. I propose, said Gordon quickly, that Percy be our desperation. So it was Percy's job to speak to the fat controller. He wished it wasn't. Please, sir, they've made me a disputation, said Percy. To speak to you, sir. Do you mean a deputation? asked the fat controller. Yes, sir. It's Donald and Douglas, sir. Please don't send them away, sir. They're nice engines, sir. The fat controller smiled. The next day, the Fat Controller went to see Donald and Douglas. I hear you have been doing good work in the snow. What colour paint would you like? The twin engines stared at him. Blue, Blue please, please sir. sir, they said in surprise. Does this mean we'll both be staying, sir? asked Donald. It certainly does, said the Fat Controller. But the rest of his speech was drowned in a delighted chorus of cheers and whistles. This is a story about Toby the tram engine. Toby loved people, but everyone thought he was too old-fashioned. He felt very sad, until one day someone came to his rescue. Toby. Toby was a tram engine. He had cow catchers and side plates and a coach called Henrietta. Toby loved people and was always happy when he could help them out. He was such a cheerful engine that people liked to help him too. Toby and Henrietta worked on a little line near a holiday town. They worked very hard, taking trucks from the farms to the main line. But they had very few passengers. It's not fair grumbled Henrietta one day. The buses are always full of passengers, even though they often have accidents. We never have accidents, but I have hardly any passengers. I can't understand it, said Toby, feeling sad. Sometimes the people on the buses laughed at Toby and called him old-fashioned. This made Toby cross. One day, a car stopped nearby, and two children jumped out. Come and look at this engine, called the little boy. A nice-looking stout gentleman followed them with two ladies. That's a tram engine, explained the stout gentleman. It's a special kind of steam train. Can we have a ride in it? asked the little girl. They all climbed into Henrietta, and the guard blew his whistle. Toby set off, feeling proud to have passengers. Hip hip hooray, sang Henrietta, as she rattled along. The stout gentleman and his family enjoyed their ride. 
Thank, Thank you, you Toby. Toby. They said. Peep, peep, whistled Toby in reply. Come again soon. We, we will, will, called the family, and they waved goodbye. As time passed, Toby and Henrietta had fewer and fewer trucks to take to the main line, and they had no passengers at all. One morning, the driver looked very sad. It's our last day, Toby, he said. The manager says we must close tomorrow. At the end of the day, Toby puffed slowly to his shed. Oh, nobody wants me, he said unhappily. But the next morning, Toby had a big surprise. A letter had arrived for his driver. It's from the stout gentleman, said the driver. Do you remember him, Toby? I remember him very well, said Toby. He knew how to speak to engines. No wonder, said his driver. That gentleman was the fat controller. The fat controller needed extra help on his railway, and he had thought of the nice little engine he had met on holiday. Toby could hardly believe it. Toby and Henrietta set off that day. They were very excited. When they arrived at Tidmouth Sheds, the fat controller came to meet them. Thank you very much for asking me to come, sir, said Toby. I'm glad you're here, Chorby, said the fat controller. I hope that you will work hard and be a useful engine, just like Thomas. I'll try, sir, said Toby. Thomas came up to say hello. He showed Toby what to do, and they were soon very good friends. Toby loved working on the Fat Controller's Railway, and he soon learned to be a really useful engine. Next to Thomas's branch line was a little cottage. The lady who lived there liked to see Toby and Thomas puffing past. She always waved to them from her window. That is Mrs Kindly, Thomas told Toby. She isn't very well, and she has to stay in bed all day. Poor lady, said Toby. I wish we could help her. From then on, Toby and Thomas always whistled to Mrs Kindly when they passed her cottage. One day it was raining hard as Thomas hurried along the track with Toby following behind. Suddenly, Thomas's driver pointed at Mrs Kindly's cottage. Something's wrong, he said. A big red cloth was waving out of the cottage window. Perhaps Mrs. Kindly needs help, said Thomas's fireman. Thomas stopped carefully, just before a bend in the track. Thomas's driver and fireman hurried to the cottage, but when they looked around the bend in the track, they understood why Mrs. Kindly had stopped them. A landslide, said the driver. Mrs. Kindly has saved our lives. Mrs. Kindly had seen the landslide and had waved her red dressing gown out of the window to warm the engines. The line was cleared the next day, and a very special train puffed along the branch line towards Mrs Kindly's cottage. First came Toby, then Thomas with Annie and Clarabel, and last of all came Henrietta. The fat controller was there too. Everyone wanted to say thank you to Mrs Kindly. When they reached the bend in the track, they stopped. The people got out and climbed up to the cottage. Toby and Thomas wished they could go too. Thomas's driver gave Mrs Kindly a new dressing gown. The guard gave her some grapes and Toby and Thomas sent some coal as a present. The engine and I would like to give you these tickets for a trip to the seaside, said the fat controller. We hope you will get better in the sunshine. You are very kind said Mrs Kindly. Toby and Thomas blew their whistles to say thank you. Toby felt very happy that he had come to work on the Fat Controller's Railway. Hip hip hooray! sang Henrietta. This is a story about Bulgy the bus. He came to work on the island of Shordor during the busy season. He thought he was better than all the engines. 
Joey tried to take their passengers away. Bulgy. It was the sightseeing season on the island of Sodor. The Fat Controller's engines were working hard. Their station was crowded with people. Duck, Donald and Douglas were taking passengers from the station to other parts of the island. Some passengers had been brought to Sodor by a big red bus called Bulgy. Bulgy looked at the crowded platform and frowned. I wouldn't have brought more passengers if I'd have known how many were here already, he said. But they are all really enjoying themselves, said Duck. Puh, replied Bulgy crossly. Duck thought Bulgy was very moody. Bulgy was rude to all the engines. Every time he saw them he shouted, Down with the railways! He said railways should be closed, so coaches, buses and cars could do everything instead. The engine thought Bulgy was rather silly, but when another bus arrived to take Bulgy's passengers home, the engines were worried. This meant Bulgy was going to stay on the island. Would he really get the railway closed down? What would the engines do then? Bulgy told the passengers that he could get them to the big station faster than the engines could. That's rubbish, said Duck. It's much further by road. Yes, said Oliver, but Bulgy says he knows a shortcut. That evening Duck was about to start his final journey of the day, but he only had a few passengers aboard. He waited for a few minutes, hoping more would turn up, but none did. Just then, Duck heard a loud toot toot. <coughs> Bulgy was leaving the station. He had a sign on his side saying railway bus. Most of Duck's passengers had gone with Bulgy because he had told them he was working for the railway. Stop! Stop! called the railway staff as Bulgy pulled away, but it was too late. Yabu yeah, snubs! Bulgy said as he roared away with the passengers. Duck and his carriages, Alice and Mirabelle, set off on their journey with the few passengers they had. Bulgy is a nasty old thief, said Alice to Mirabelle. He's taken our people. Duck knew they had to stop Bulgy taking their passengers. If it carried on like this, the railway could be shut down. He wondered what they should do. But Bulgy was about to be stopped. His shortcut led down a narrow road with a low bridge. As he rushed under the bridge, there was a sudden screeching noise and he ground to a halt. He tried to move forwards and he tried to move backwards, but it was no good. He was totally stuck. Cars and coaches beeped angrily at Bulgy because he was blocking the road. A tour bus like you should never have gone down this road, they said. Bulge's passengers were furious. We should have gone with Duck, they said. He would never let us down like this. We're going to miss our train at the big station, and it's all your fault, they shouted at Bulgy. Bulgy didn't say a word. As Duck reached the bridge, a man appeared by the track waving a red warning flag. Danger! he cried. A bus is stuck under the bridge! Duck moved slowly forward. He saw Bulgy under the bridge. So that is Bulgy's so-called shortcut! He laughed. Bulgy held his breath as Duck slowly moved over the bridge. The bus tricked us! said Bulgy's passengers. He said he was working for the railway, but he lied. Can we go with you instead? Duck agreed and took all the passengers to the big station in time for their train. The passengers promised they would always travel by train from then on. Bulgy was left under the bridge. He had to wait all night before he was rescued. He didn't learn his lesson though. He still thought he could take over the railway. But by then everyone knew that it was faster to go by train, so they all travelled with the engines instead. 
Bolgy decided to retire. He asked a farmer if he could live in his field and look after his hens. The farmer agreed. From that day on, Bolgy was much happier. The hens enjoyed hearing about his grand adventures on the bus route and how terrible engines were. They didn't know any better, and Bolgy felt proud because the hens produced more eggs than ever before. This is a story about Elizabeth, the vintage sentinel lorry. Sadly, she was left to rust in a shed for a long time. Find out what happened when Thomas's driver found her there. Elizabeth. Thomas was taking heavy goods trucks to a cargo ship at Brendan Docks. The ship was leaving at sundown, so Thomas had to work hard to get the trucks there in time. Suddenly, one of his coupling rods broke. His driver saw a shed by the track. I'll see if there are some tools in there, he said. Be careful, that shed looks a bit spooky, said Thomas. Then a voice came from inside the shed. Be quiet out there, I'm trying to sleep. Thomas's driver went into the shed. After a few moments, he came out again. Well, is it a ghost? asked Thomas. No, laughed his driver. It's not a ghost, it's a very helpful surprise. Thomas's driver and fireman took coal into the shed. Thomas wondered what they were doing. She should be able to get us to the fitter's yard, Thomas heard his driver say. If her boiler holds, replied his fireman, she badly needs repair work. Thomas heard lots of clanking noises coming from the shed. What could be inside? At last, out of the shed drove a rather dirty old steam lorry. Thomas, this is Elizabeth, said his driver. So you're the little puffer that has broken down, said Elizabeth to Thomas. Thomas didn't like that at all. You're a rude old steam lorry, he replied sharply. Actually, I'm a vintage sentinel lorry, replied Elizabeth. And you should be thankful that I'm here to help you. Elizabeth and Thomas's driver went to the fitter's yard. Elizabeth's engine made loud grinding noises. As she drove up a steep hill, her engine got louder and louder. Mm. You're not built for hills, said Thomas's driver. Will you make it? I'll be fine, replied Elizabeth. I'm just catching my breath. Before long, Elizabeth reached the fitter's yard. Thomas's driver fetched a new coupling rod, and they drove back to Thomas. Elizabeth felt very proud. She realised that she had been in the shed for so long that she had forgotten how much fun it was to help others. Thomas was impressed with how quickly Elizabeth had fetched the coupling rod. He was about to thank her when she said, Next time, make sure you're not so careless. Now Thomas thought Elizabeth was the rudest lorry he had ever met. He waited in silence while his driver fitted the new coupling rod. Then he set off to the docks. Elizabeth decided to follow Thomas to the docks. That little puffer has already broken one coupling rod, so he may well need my help again, she thought. Elizabeth's engine rattled and groaned as she slowly followed behind Thomas. Soon Thomas was out of sight, but Elizabeth didn't mind. She remembered which road she had to take to get to the docks. Thomas arrived at the docks just in time. As the goods were unloaded from his trucks, the fat controller came over. He looked very cross indeed. Where have you been? he asked. You nearly missed the boat. Thomas told him about his broken coupling rod. He was about to tell him about Elizabeth when she drove up. Oh, it's you, said Elizabeth to the fat controller. Have you learned how to drive properly yet? Thomas thought the fat controller would be very angry. But to his surprise, the fat controller said, Elizabeth, the first lorry I ever drove. How marvellous to see you again. Where have you been? Thomas couldn't believe it. Elizabeth and the fat controller were friends. 
Elizabeth told the Fat Controller that she had been left in the shed a long time ago and everyone had forgotten about her. She had thought she would never drive again. The Fat Controller was really pleased that Elizabeth had been found. He asked Jem Cole, the mechanic, to restore her to her original beauty. Elizabeth smiled happily and thanked the Fat Controller. She could hardly wait to be in full working order again. A few weeks later, Elizabeth drove past the Fat Controller's station. Her paintwork shone and her engine sounded perfect. Hello, she said. Don't you think my new paintwork looks marvellous? You're the grandest lorry in the whole railroad, replied the Fat Controller. Thomas had to agree, and Elizabeth was so happy now she was useful again that she wasn't rude at all. This is a story about Cranky the Crane. He worked at the docks on the island of Shodor. He played tricks on the engines to get them into trouble, but one day Cranky needed the engines help. Cranky. Thomas and Percy liked working at the docks, so when the Fat Controller told them they would be working there for two weeks, they could hardly wait. But when they arrived at the docks, there was a new crane there called Cranky. Cranky was always moody, and he called Thomas and Percy useless little bugs. The two engines were very upset. They told Gordon and James about how rude Cranky had been. To their surprise, James and Gordon backed up Cranky. He's so high up in the air, said James. Facing the wind, rain and sunshine, it's no wonder he looks down and sees you as annoying little bugs. Thomas and Percy hoped Cranky would stop being so mean to them. The next day, Cranky played a trick on Thomas. He told him to move the trucks to the outer track. Thomas was surprised, but he did as he was told. When the Fat Controller arrived, Cranky said, I asked Thomas to put those trucks on the inner track, but he has put them on the outer track where I can't reach them, and Percy won't do as he's told either. The Fat Controller was furious. He sent the engines back to the station in disgrace. Thomas and Percy were shocked. Cranky was making it all up. A storm raged across the island of Sodor that night. At the Fat Controller's station, Thomas and Percy talked about Cranky. They were upset that the Fat Controller had believed his lies. They wondered if they'd ever be allowed to work at the docks again. If Cranky is going to continue being nasty to us, then I don't want to work at the docks anyway, Thomas said. Percy had to agree. At the docks, the wind and rain was lashing down on Cranky. He wasn't worried though. He thought he was much stronger than any storm. In the shed nearby, Duck, James and Gordon were listening to the storm. They thought they were safe there, but they were wrong. A huge steamer had got loose and it was heading straight for the docks. The steamer ran aground. It charged through the docks, crashing into the shed and knocking over Cranky. Duck, Gordon and James were trapped. They called to Cranky for help, but Cranky had fallen onto his side, so he needed rescuing too. Cranky and the engines had to wait for the storm to clear before they could be rescued. The next morning, the Fat Controller went to the docks. Thomas and Percy are coming to help you, Cranky, he said. They'll have you up again in no time. Oh, thank you, said Cranky. Um, can you tell them I'm sorry that I was so mean to them? Sure, it was you that was causing all the trouble, said the Fat Controller. It seems I owe those engines an apology. Thomas and Percy's drivers tied ropes to Cranky and attached them to the engines. Thomas and Percy quickly pulled Cranky back upright. Cranky was very glad to see the world the right way up again. He got straight to work clearing away the rubble. Cranky moved the steamer back into the water and it was carefully tied in place. 
Then it was safe for him to pull the heavy rubble away from the shed so the trapped engines could get out. Duck, Gordon and James were very grateful. They had not liked being stuck in the shed. They thanked Cranky for his help. Cranky told them that Thomas and Percy had rescued him first. I never thought I'd be rescued by a couple of... Cranky was about to say bugs, but he stopped himself just in time. Um, he continued. I never thought I would be saved by a couple of small engines. I'll try not to be rude to you again. Thomas and Percy smiled. They were just about to reply when Cranky said, Now move out of the way, you mites. I need to get to those trucks. Pah, said Percy. Cranky wasn't polite for long. He's back to bugging us. Percy quickly moved up the track to get out of Cranky's way, but he had forgotten that his ropes were still attached to Cranky. Wait, cried Thomas, but it was too late. As Percy charged forward, the rope pulled taut, and Cranky crashed back to the ground with a thump. Thomas and Percy had to pull Cranky up for the second time. Cranky felt very silly. Now Cranky works well with Thomas and Percy. He still looks down on them from his high perch in the sky, but he never calls them bugs or mites. After that stormy night, he knows they can be really useful engines. After all, they had rescued him twice. And if Cranky is ever knocked over again, he knows the little engines will quickly put him back in his place. This is a story about Terence the Tractor. When Thomas met Terence ploughing a field, he was very rude to him. But when Snow came to Sodor, Thomas found out that Terence's caterpillar tracks could be really useful. Terence. Autumn had arrived on the island of Sodor. The leaves were changing from green to brown, and the fields were changing too, from yellow stubble to brown earth. As Thomas puffed along, he heard the chug-chug-chug of a tractor at work close by. Hello, said Thomas to the tractor. I'm Thomas. I'm pulling a train. Hello, said the tractor. My name's Terence. I'm ploughing. What ugly wheels you've got, said Thomas. They're not ugly. They're called caterpillars, said Terence. I can go anywhere. I don't need rails. I don't want to go just anywhere, replied Thomas huffily. I like my rails, thank you very much. The next time Thomas saw Terence ploughing a field, he called out to him. You've missed a bit. Over there in the corner, silly old tractor. And he whistled rudely. Terence carried on ploughing and didn't reply. Winter came, and with it dark heavy clouds full of snow. A snowplough was fixed to Thomas, but it was heavy and uncomfortable, and he hated it. He shook it and banged it until it was so dented that eventually it had to be taken off. You're a very naughty engine, said his driver as he shut the shed door that night. The next morning, the driver and fireman worked hard to mend the snowplough, but they couldn't make it fit properly so Thomas had to set out without it. I don't need that stupid old thing, he said to himself. Snow is silly, soft stuff. It won't stop me. But as he rode along, the snow kept making his wheels spin, and he found it quite a struggle. He passed Terence in a field. You seem to be having some trouble there, called out Terence. It's a pity you don't have caterpillars. Then the snow wouldn't bother you. This time, it was Thomas who didn't reply. Silly soft stuff, silly soft stuff, puffed Thomas as he continued on his journey, and he rushed into a tunnel. At the other end, he saw a heap of snow fallen from the sides of the cutting. Stupid old snow, said Thomas, and charged it. Cinders and ashes, said Thomas as he ground to a halt. I'm stuck. And he was. Oh, my wheels and coupling rods, said Thomas sadly. 
I shall have to stay here till I'm frozen. And he began to cry. Just then, who should come chugging along but Terence the tractor? I heard you were in trouble, said Terence, so I've come to help. First, Terence pulled Annie and Clarabel away from the snowdrift. Thank, Thank you, Terence. Thank, Thank you, Terence, they said. They were very relieved to be free of the snow and were sorry that Thomas had been so rude to Terence. Next, Terence came back for Thomas. He pulled and pulled, but Thomas was buried so deeply in the snow that Terence wasn't strong enough to move him. I shall never escape, thought Thomas sadly. The driver and fireman tried to dig the snow away from Thomas, but as fast as they dug, more snow slipped down. At last, Thomas's wheels were clear, but they still spun helplessly when he tried to move. Terence tugged and slipped and slipped and tugged, and eventually, with the most enormous effort, he dragged Thomas clear of the snow and into the tunnel. Thomas was very grateful. Thank you, Terence, he said. I think your caterpillars are splendid. I'm sorry I was so rude to you before. My caterpillars are certainly useful, said Terence, but I can't go very fast. I couldn't pull a passenger train like you can, Thomas. Well, my wheels wouldn't be much use for ploughing a field, replied Thomas. And with that, Terence returned to his farm, while Thomas puffed tiredly back to the engine shed. From then on, Terence and Thomas were good friends. Whenever they passed each other, they always exchanged a cheerful greeting, and they were never rude to each other again. This is a story about Scar Louie, the narrow gauge engine. Scar Louie first came to my railway 100 years ago. Read about the troubles he had when he was brand new and couldn't stop bouncing up and down. Scar Louie. Scar Louie worked on the little railway on the island of Sodor. He was 100 years old, but he was still a useful engine. All the other engines liked Scar Lowy, and he would tell them stories about when he was young. Everyone's favourite story was about the time Scar Lowy first came to the little railway. Scar Lowy was built at the same time as another engine called Reneus. They were both red, with four wheels each. We look wonderful, said Scar Lowy proudly. We will pull coaches, and everyone will want to ride in them replied Reneus. Scar Lowy and Reneus were both going to work on the mountain line of the little railway, but Scar Lowy was finished first, so he had to go to the little railway alone, leaving Reneus behind. The two engines felt sad when they said goodbye to each other. Scar Lowy was sent away on a ship. It was very wobbly. At the port they used the ship's cranes to lift Scar Lowy onto the shore. The ship's cranes were called derricks, and they nearly turned Scar Lowy upside down. How dare they treat me like this, said Scar Lowy crossly. He was left hanging from the derricks for a long time. At last an engine arrived to take him to the mountain line. About time, huffed Scar Lowy. It was dark when Scar Lowy arrived at the mountain line. He felt lonely and miserable. I wish Reneus was here, he said sadly. Next morning there were trucks everywhere. They rattled and roared past Scar Lowy. There's no engine pulling them, said Scar Lowy in surprise. The trucks come down the mountain by gravity, explained the manager. But the empty ones need taking up again. That's why you've come. What? said Scar Lowy crossly. I don't want to pull trucks. Can't I pull coaches, sir? Certainly not, said the manager. We have to finish building this line, and for that we need trucks. The inspector is coming to look at the line soon. Scar Lowy was furious. When the workman tried to start him, his fire wouldn't burn. He made no steam. 
he just blew smoke at them. They tried again the next day, and the next, and the next, but Scarlowy wouldn't do a thing. Finally, the manager lost his temper. We're not going to look at your sulky face all day, Scarlowy, he said. We'll leave you alone until you're a better engine. They covered Scarlowy with a big sheet of tarpaulin and went away. Scarlowy felt even more lonely and unhappy. Nobody talked to him. At last the manager came back. I hope you will be a better engine from now on, he said. Yes, sir. I will, sir, said Scarlowy earnestly. From then on, Scarlowy worked very hard. And although he sometimes got too excited and would bounce up and down, the manager was very pleased with his efforts. By the time Reneas arrived at last, the line was ready. Scarloe was delighted to see his old friend. Reneas soon settled in. One day while he was shunting trucks, Scarloe hurried up to him. I'm going to pull the inspector's train today, said Scarloe. Be careful not to bounce, said Reneas. The inspector won't like that. But Scarloe was so excited, he just couldn't stop bouncing. Scarloe had to take the inspector up to the top of the mountain and then back down again. The upward journey went well, and Scarloe felt very happy. When it was time to go down, Scarloe was really excited. As they went faster and faster, he began to bounce. The coaches were scared. He's, He's playing, playing tricks, they said. Bump, bump him, him, bump, bump him. him. Just then, Scarloe gave an extra big bounce, and the inspector lost his footing. He flew into a bush on the side of the line. The driver stopped the train. The inspector was not hurt, but he was very cross. From now on, you will stay in the shed. He said to Scarloe, you are a bad engine. When the inspector told the manager what had happened, the manager felt sorry for Scarloe. He knew that he had been trying very hard to be good. What Scarloe needs is an extra pair of wheels, he said. Then he won't bounce anymore. So Scarloe was sent off to the works. When Scarloe came back, Reneas hardly recognised him. He had six wheels and a brand new cab, and he looked very smart. Now let's see what you can do, said the manager. Sure enough, Scarloe found it much easier to travel along smoothly, without bouncing. From then on, Scarloe pulled coaches and trucks up and down the track as easily as anything, and he didn't bounce his passengers once. And 100 years later, he is still as good as new. This is a story about Mavis, the diesel engine. Mavis worked at the quarry, shunting trucks. She was bored with her job until one day she was given the chance to make it more exciting. Mavis. Mavis was a diesel engine who worked at the quarry. She shunted trucks for other engines to collect. Mavis was a young engine and she liked to get her own way. She thought she knew better than everyone else. Every day Mavis would put Toby's trucks in a different place, so he had to search for them. Trucks should be where I can find them, said Toby crossly. Nonsense, said Mavis. I can't waste time arguing, said Toby. If you know so much, then take the trucks yourself. Mavis was very pleased. Taking trucks on Toby's branch line made her feel important. So, the next day Mavis set off along the branch line with Toby's trucks. But the trucks didn't like bossy Mavis. It's, it's frosty, frosty today, today. Let's, let's play, play a trick, trick on, on her. her. They whispered. Mavis travelled happily along Toby's line. Ahead of her was a level crossing, so she stopped carefully. I'm so good at this, I don't need silly old Toby. She laughed, but she didn't know what the trucks were planning. When it was time to move again, the trucks whispered to each other. Hold back! Hold, hold back. back! Mavis tried to set off, but her wheels just spun. 
she couldn't get a grip on the frosty ground. The troublesome trucks giggled and giggled. The drivers of the cars and lorries waiting at the level crossing were getting very angry. But there was nothing Mavis could do. Then Mavis saw Toby approaching in the distance. He had come to help. Having trouble, Mavis? He smiled. Mavis felt cross and silly. She had boasted to Toby that she knew best, and now she was stuck and Toby had to rescue her. Toby was coupled to Mavis. He puffed and slipped, and at last he got Mavis and the trucks moving. Mavis hardly helped at all. She didn't even say thank you. When Mavis got back to the quarry, the fat controller was very cross with her. You are a naughty engine, he said. You will stay here in future. Mavis felt angry. She thought the quarry was boring. She wished she could go on Toby's branch line again. Soon spring arrived on Sodor. It was a very busy time at the quarry. Every day Mavis got the trucks ready for Toby, but she was never allowed to take them along Toby's branch line. Then, one day, Mavis had an idea. She said to the troublesome trucks, When I get to the beginning of Toby's line, please will you bump me? Then I'll be on his line whether he likes it or not. Yes, 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 yes. giggled the trucks. I'll show that fuss pot Toby, said Mavis to herself. But when the time came, Mavis was busy elsewhere, so Toby shunted the trucks himself. Never mind, the trucks whispered to each other. Let's bump Toby, Toby instead. instead. So they gave Toby a big bump. He rushed onto his branch line much too fast. His driver and fireman were knocked over. Toby was out of control. Toby couldn't stop. He rushed over the level crossing. Luckily, there weren't any cars there. Up ahead, there was an old bridge. The river had flooded and part of the bridge had been washed away. If Toby didn't stop before he reached it, he might fall in the river. As Toby approached the bridge, the rails stretched across the gap, just like a tightrope. His driver braked hard, but Toby slid along the track. His brakes squealed. He used every bit of his strength and stopped just in time. Mavis felt terrible. It was all her fault. So she rushed to the rescue. First she pulled the trucks back up the track. Then she helped pull Toby carefully away from the bridge. I'm sorry, Toby, she said. It's all my fault. Never mind, Mavis said Toby kindly. Thank you for rescuing me. After that day, Mavis and Toby became good friends. Mavis still bossed the trucks around at the quarry, but she always listened to Toby's advice. And sometimes, for a special treat, Toby would let Mavis take the trucks carefully along his branch line. 